Now, confirmations and countries, of course, you are familiar with Benedict Edinson's uh, imagined communities. And Malaysia more so, because we grew uh, to become a nation through uh, historical excellence and part, demography, region, which is quite unique in the history of the world. So we can therefore understand and appreciate the diversity, the contentious debates on race, religion, regions, they will continue in many ways to affect and influence the direction of this nation. And I don't think for the younger generation should be utterly surprised or somewhat depressed when you hear contrarian views, extremist tendencies or expressions that do not necessarily represent the vast majority of our people. If you uh, look at historical antecedents, you will realize that we grew as a nation, the Malay nation, the Chinese nation, and some pockets of the Indian ethnic nation. The demands prior to independence has always been extremely parochial, extremely racial, and in many ways do not represent what is termed as imagined communities as one nation. Now, the younger generation must take cognizance of this, not to accept this as present realities, but to understand that we grew from that uh, complex, challenging, and in many ways, very contentious debates. If you look at this, if you, if, you are just, if you are a student of history, you'll be utterly shocked as a Democrat, as a liberal, as uh, in a way Malaysian, to see such uh, extreme views propounded to be a purely Malay nation, or the complete absolute right of the Chinese in the state settlements. But that is part and parcel of our history. Now, I mean, this reality don't be too, you look too serious and depressed, so I'm an optimist. But what I'm saying is, if you understand historical antecedents, then you will not be necessarily disturbed by these aberrations, uh, the trends uh, which is not seen to be healthy at present. A country must mature. This is precisely our challenge now. Has it matured as a democracy? Must our debate remain contentious and racial and religious as it was in the 50s, 40s, or even 60s? Now, the answer has to be that the country must mature as a democracy. And our society, therefore, must necessarily take into cognizance the past history, yes, in a way that has been well defined in our constitution. Shah Fawkin I don't touch what legal matters, I don't have a problem with him. But in terms of constitutional guarantees, it is generally quite acceptable. Uh, I do appreciate again some uh, of the young younger uh, Malaysians who then still continue to raise uh, why must Bahasa Melayu becomes Bahasa Malaysia, Bahasa Rasmi? Why must we still retain the Daulatan Raja Raja Melayu? Or Hak Kesimewaan, especially with the capabilities? Or Islam as a religion of federation? To my mind, any nation, in the constructive nation, there are certain fundamental guarantees that need to be acknowledged and accepted. The problem is not with Bahasa as a national language. The problem is the obscure, skewed interpretation of the provisions of the Constitution. When, 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 when you take it upon yourself to interpret, the rule, for example, of Islam as the religion of the federation. Yes, you must respect that. You ask me, I 
as a person. I would say, I would like Muslims to be practicing Muslims, good Muslims, which means more tolerant, more humane, believe in peace and justice. Of course, this is a, clearly a disconnect with some of the expressions and sentiments expressed by the extremist elements. Similarly, on the issue of Bahasa, which continue, unfortunately, to be somewhat contentious. I would say that this country must ensure a level of proficiency of, of the national language to be proud of, which is not the case now. Because the standard of Bahasa in this country is somewhat not mature and grown, consistent with the advance, for example, of Bahasa in Indonesia. Having said that, I think for a, a, a country, a government, universities must take into conferences to assure the students, the intellectual community, the elites of this country, that we will not derail from what was agreed upon with the Constitution. The difference here, I would suggest, is that is to recognize, to accept the fact that in 2020, we need to enhance the level of proficiency of other languages, namely the English language. Which means any medicine must be well proficient in the Bahasa. But at the same time, it is expected that any educated medicine must have a level of proficiency of the English language that can be uh, seen or, or, or at par with the international community. Now, this is not a zero-sum game. For those who want to promote Bahasa the expert of English, I think the ideas are obsolete. Because we want Malaysia to emerge as a thriving nation, economically, politically vibrant, with a level of proficiency of many languages, and English happens to be a very important international language. And the unfortunate part is that the level of Bahasa has not somewhat improved exponentially. At the same time, we have seen the level of English has somewhat declined. And that is, of course, something very disconcerting in this country, which must take every effort to enhance the level of proficiency of the American Jewish to enhance the level of proficiency of the English language. Now, then we have Chinese. I used to say the debate between the Malay School Graduates Association and the Chinese educationists in the 50s is no longer relevant. Because if you look at the again sort of dissidents, those who plan for Chinese language has no regard or respect for the Malay people for Bahasa. Similarly, those who have been promoting the use of Bahasa completely ignore the right of mother tongue language to be taught in schools. But now, we have need to depart because Chinese language becomes the very important economic language of the region. I don't see Bahasa Mandarin as a language of the Chinese sacro. No, no longer. It is now a, 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 a very, um, what, what should I say, an important economic language, which means is if a Malay student is naturally has to be profound in Bahasa and then takes up Mandarin, then he would accrue all the benefits professionally and also in terms of possibility of employment because of the way we view uh, the importance of Bahasa Mandarin as an economic, important economic language of religion. You see in the States, in the United States, for example, they have pragmatic systems. Uh, of course, they have English language, or they don't call it English, they call it American English. I don't know what it means, but anyway, I wouldn't want to debate on that. I was at St. Anthony's Oxford and then went to teach at Georgetown University. You go to the restaurant and says, water, please. You say, what? 
I said, what? You mean what? <laughs> you see, so I may be trained at Oxford, but this bartender corrected my language, my pronunciation. That's how proud Americans are. Anyway, it's non political strip, it's linguistic. <laughs> it's called linguistic nationalism. <laughs> now, Boba Tamil, and I'm back to the United States, I realized that even science, when I was uh, there for, for a while, the most uh, popular second language was, of course, Spanish at the time. But then, in many uh, universities, Chinese or Mandarin has surpassed uh, Spanish. The most important American language. I don't believe this is for the love of Chinese or Chinese civilizations or because they want to understand journey to the West in English or the romance of three kingdoms in Chinese. No, it is because they see it as an important economic language. I think the lesson must think in that direction. Not at the expense, at the expense of Bahasa, not at the expense of national identity, but for the interest of a nation, a thriving, vibrant, Malaysian nation, economically vibrant and politically esteemed. And I think that should be the narrative. Uh, similarly with Islam, or even the issue of Malay privileges, I think uh, the criticism was that it was then extended to the new economic policy uh, from a purely, uh, 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 the effort to uplift the uh, socio-economic conditions of the poorer communities became largely a race-based economic program. Now, I would say that I would even concede in 1971 when Tor Raza envisioned this new uh, policy and launched the nuclear policy, I was quite supportive because there was a time when uh, the Malays felt that the um, in terms of the number of professionals, business opportunity, they were lagging terribly behind. But that was never said in 1971. Now we are in 2020. The notion of an economic policy based on race is getting terribly untenable. But affirmative action is acceptable. And that's why in my sessions, the constructing nation, we want the elites to, to be more sensitive and appreciative of the concerns of the poor. They can be the vast segment of the poor Malays or the those from Hatland of Sabah and Sarawak, or the Chinese squatters in the suburban uh, Kuala Lumpur or cities, or the Indians in the estates. In many uh, cases, including or us, they are still living under horrendous economic conditions. Now, this can be resolved through not a race based economic policy, but a need based economic policy, economic action. But it must also be a national narrative. And I think we are failing in that because of the failure of intellectuals and elites in addressing the issue. If it comes purely a segmented political concern of some politicians. I have been virtually at war with many of our, my colleagues and the disturbed elites, including Zaid Ibrahim, uh, to make sure that they help articulate this vision more profoundly to see that the elites, those who have um, benefited from the nation, have done reasonably well, show enough passion and concern for those who are struggling just to live. And if this is done, I believe, honestly, many of those so-called, uh, again, engaging, angry expressions and debate about rights and economic, socioeconomic problems can be adequately answered or solved. And I think um, we need to create this awareness. Um, Look at poverty. Before that, I was uh, in the last few months I've been publicizing this Boston uh, Consulting Group uh, analysis about the state of our economy. Um, based on what is called a sustainable economic development assessment, SEDA. 
sustainable economic development assessment, looking at growth, uh, social conditions, health, education, welfare, etc. The country has somewhat stagnated in terms of economic for the last one decade. This stagnation viewed from the comprehensive assessment the Malaysia as a country has somewhat stagnated. Ten years we have lost time. And we look at poverty, it's no longer 0.4% that the economic planning unit in the past have claimed. We have Professor Ramilion, who was his chair, we have UNICEF, UNDP, World Bank Studies, Jomo and all the rest have now identified the problem is quite severe. The six decades of independence, we still have close to 20% of our population under this of our population under this abject poor category. The grinding poverty is a problem that we can resolve. We have the resources. We have the means. We have generally a good system of bureaucracy. But why did we fail? Of course, issue of governance, of endemic and rampant corruption, of abuse of power, of major gross leakages in this system. I mean, notwithstanding my differences with the previous administration, I would still say that in terms of um, allocation for the poor, there have been quite reasonable, about 26 to 28 billion ringgit per year. But in terms of the deliverance, the benefit accrued to the real people, then we have billions of leakages. Uh, through corruption, through abuse, etc. And uh, we as a country, for the nation, is to my mind untenable to defend country with uh, condoning this uh, so policy that completely ignore 20% of our population. And I'm not talking about gross inequality. The issue with inequality is not necessarily new, of course, um, popularized in a way by Piketty's inequality and was Stiglitz, and there are lots of books uh, now written about the need for the third pillar to ensure that intermediate societies like what Tocqueville, Tocqueville will talk about democracy, a vibrant democracy is when people are given that sort of understanding. That generally, it's not just political elite and business elite, but who create this level of awareness among the people that he called, he termed as intermediate associations in Alexis Tocqueville's uh, Democracy in America. And I think that, of course, we need to ensure a growing number who has that sort of awareness. But back to inequality, it is a problem that we discussed, that was, that we discussed earlier. I, was, uh, I recall, for example, since 1961, other than Guazis, who talks about grinding poverty, among the Malay peasantry, Said Hussein Ali, in his dissertation, talks about inequality in Johor, village, Basra, Pahang, and Kedah. But somehow or other, we never managed to become narrative of the elites. So it is a major challenge at the Paul for health university to ensure that the issue of poverty and inequality must be in our narrative to ensure that all of us, Malays, Chinese, Indians, Ibans, Kadazan, feel that they have hope in the future in constructing this nation. Now, final point is on the economy, not the transition. I know what I want to hear. I mean, uh, so, you are very popular day in the full. Yeah, I just want to hear one word. When? <laughs> <laughs> now, um, the last quarter was 0.4.3%. Very disconcerting. This quarter, 
expected to go low because of the virus affecting mainly tourism and some other related industries. So that's why I think Papakatan uh, Harapan must remain strong and clear in our policies. You ask me, I think uh, my position is very clear. We have, uh, we won to some unexpected. I was in prison, I was very optimistic. I have no other choice. <laughs> but uh, let's give credit to Tunwade for navigating a very turbulent, difficult times of this transition. And, and uh, that's why people ask, I said, no, I mean, there should not be excessive demand. Give him the latitude and space to navigate with our full support. This will not stop, of course, politics. Uh, suddenly, Pass wants to become a kingmaker. God help us. <laughs> but notwithstanding some of these irritants, I think we should remain focused. Are you asking? Um, according to the agreement, transition will take place. Don't want this. Repeatedly assured. I have no reason to question his sincerity. The policies are somewhat the same because of the Pakatan Harapan policies. People are not questioning the policy. People are questioning that we are not that committed or serious in implementing the policies. So my task is therefore to ensure that when I see you of this, I will continue to create this uh, nation as a mature democracy, rule of law. And assuring the vast majority of our Malays that you will be secure that any government, and particularly my government, will undertake and all measures possible to ensure that the issues of poverty, inequality, and equal opportunities be given. The difference is not just to you, the Malays, that I have then to be see and reflect in my policies the transparent governments that we seriously concern myself with the welfare of every single Malay, Chinese, Indian, Iban, Kazakh in our country. <laughs> Not for decades, I've been popularizing this woman to see each other. I don't want people to feel that this is just another political rhetoric or gimmick. I believe and I mean it. And, um, I've suffered immensely. I'm not talking about my suffering, oh my God. It was tough. But when my years of campaign, when I said, if you want to be a truly Malaysian leader, Every Malay is a Malay, is a Muslim too, I would say. Religion is about peace, about justice, about compassion. You don't have that. You can come with a big turban or recite verses of the Quran. It means nothing to us. Okay. And to become a leader of this country, or this nation, then you must honestly have the same passion that the Malay child is my child, the Chinese child is my child, or the Indian, or the Iban, or the Kazakhstan are our children, may must be given a <laughs> And that's my case, thank you very much.